Okay, enough screen time. Oh, Dad, can you listen to the radio instead, please? I suppose so. They play some good tunes on... Not your boring grown-up station. It's not. Funk it, please. We can get that downstairs on the smart speaker, not in the bedroom. It's okay. We can get it on the app. If you say so. Okay. Thanks, Dad. Now, let me have your tablet. Screen time is over. About that, you just said we can listen on the app. And the app is on our tablet. It was downloaded from the App Store for free yesterday by Mum. But... You did promise. Listen anywhere. Smart kids listen on Smart Speaker. This is Fun Kids. Grab your BFFs and get stuck into Girl Talk magazine. Full of your fave celebs and YouTubers, each issue is packed with fun, including puzzles and cute pets, quizzes and amazing bakes. All this plus awesome prizes, fab fashion and amazing gifts. Girl Talk magazine. Get it every month. What are you waiting for? Hello and welcome back to Bookworms. My name is Bex and I love books. And I am so happy because, oh my goodness, this week we have got a jam packed episode for you. We'll be hearing all about Tapper Watson and the quest for the Nemo machine by Claire Fayers. We'll be chatting to Kimberly Whittam about Quiet Storm, but first we've got a chat with one of my favourite people ever. Not just authors, just just people. It's Dermot O'Leary talking all about Wings of Glory. All right, we are joined by a friend of the show, presenter and author Dermot O'Leary. Yeah, Dermot, how are you doing? Hello. Oh, I'm... Um... Tip top, how are you? It's been a long time, man. Um, and you've been a busy man. You've brought us a new book. Just thinking that. When's the last time I spoke to you? It's been, it's been over a year. I was thinking you were avoiding me, to be honest. <laughs> After that last interview? Yeah. Ah, I'm never going back. Done. Done and done. Ah, <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I've, I've, yeah, I've loved doing this book. It's, it's been a, God, when did I, where are we now? I probably finished it at the start of the year. Right. And then you sort of send it off and there's loads of questions come back. Why have you done this? Uh, <laughs> is this true? Is this historically accurate? Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I love every every stage of it, to be honest with you. It's, it's such an enjoyable thing to do. So if the listeners don't know, we've gone from cats to birds. Uh, you love an animal. And this is Wings of Glory, which I... Well, let's go back to it then. Is it historically accurate, Dermot? How much of this have you researched properly? Uh, no. Uh, during the Second World War, what a lot of people don't know is that the animals were fighting on our behalf. Mm-hmm. And uh, with with some notable exceptions and we had a prime minister so whilst Winston Churchill was in charge the animal prime minister was Sir Bertie Bulldog and um, Bertie Bulldog signed an official secrets act they didn't want any uh, records to be disclosed up until now about Linus the Swift and Linus's incredible actions during the Battle of Britain when he signed up for the Royal Bird Force so the story is true story yeah uh, that Linus the Bird and his sister Linus the Swift and his sister Ava uh, were born in Kent and then they migrated down to sub-Saharan Africa. And then during the war, the call went out for all birds of a flying age and uh, especially speedsters. And the swift is one of the speediest birds there is to come back and fight on the front line to harass the uh, German enemy planes coming over um, by any means necessary. But basically the mantra of the Royal Bird Force was in poo we trust. So the idea is uh, they have to poo, use their poo as much as they can on the enemy windshields, on the planes, the planes then get distracted and then the actual human RAF can come and, uh, and mop up uh, after all their hard work. So Linus signs up for the, uh, to, to be in the Royal Bird Force, but when he gets here, He's just he's desperate. He wants to fight in the front line because he's a swift and they're the fastest birds, but equally fast are the peregrine falcons. Uh, and so he wants to fight in the squadron of peregrine falcons, but they won't have him because he's not um, a kind of blue blood because the peregrines are very much considered the, you know, the, the, the proper flying boys and girls. So Linus ends up in a squadron with uh, a magpie who steals everything, sure. uh, an owl who won't get out of bed before eight in the uh, in the evening. Uh, so he ends up in this raggletag squadron, but somehow, he he ends up being pivotal with to world history. What well, should we just stop the interview there? Should we just done? Done, I'm done. <laughs> I do feel like I've actually just told you probably a bit too much. No, but, I love um... it. No, that was that was such a, such a cracking summary of the book because yeah, we meet Linus the Swift, uh, him and his sister Ava. They go off to the UK to try and fight for country and king and country. And um and yeah, it, Linus is so excited and also like you say, he's a very quick bird, right? And at first, people don't take him seriously. Yeah, he's he's almost too quick. And also he's very young and he's very raw. And all he wants to do is 
is come over and, and, and fly with the Peregrine Falcons. And of course, he isn't a Peregrine. And so he can't do what they do, but also they can't do what he do. Uh, he does. So uh, I, I love that about it. Like, I love my birds. I've always loved, I've always been a sort of keen bird watcher. And uh, my best friend, Joe, my oldest friend, Joe, is, he got me into birds when I was about 11. And I've always loved them ever since. So you know, writing for the books about Toto was wonderful. And I love the fact that to create a world where the animals have got their own transport system yeah. and government and police and all those sort of things is so interesting. And, and actually, sort of, that's what was cool, almost my starting point. Because I, I, I was, not, I, yeah, I haven't finished my Toto books, but I thought, well, what, what else do I re- want to write about? And I love history, and the Second World War is sort of my, you know, my favourite part of history. But maybe I don't quite know why. I like the idea of ordinary people put in extraordinary circumstance, and I love the idea of it's quite recent history. So for me, my grandparents' generation would have been part of it. For a lot of your listeners, would be the great grandparents' generation. But you know, my father grew up. Yeah, in Ireland, but in the you know in the forties, so he grew up, you know, being aware of what was going on in the Second World War. So it's not that long ago, is my point. And you know, it's 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 kind of so it's kind of recent history and these incredible stories, you know, that that, that you can read about that that humans kind of, you know, this kind of normal everyday people suddenly put in life changing circumstance. I find that. Fa- absolutely fascinating and we always ask the question what would I have done mm. and then I thought well I, I really enjoy writing for kids and and, and through the prism and, and the personification of like animals so hey what I do that why don't I take my love of history and combine the two so it's kind of there will be ac- actually echoes in, in the books coming forward there'll be echoes of kind of, uh, of of the people that went before Toto who worked for the government so you tell us in the book you mentioned a pilot as well called Ginger uh, was he real because I noticed at the back you kind of left a note I did, yeah. So Ginger was based on, um, or, or really inspired by a lovely man I met a few years ago. I did a, I did a documentary about the Battle of Britain, and uh, his name was Tom Neal, Tom Ginger Neal. And Tom sadly has passed away now, but he did live to a very ripe old age, was well into his 90s. And I met him when he was about 94, and Tom was a very uh, sharp, uh, funny, warm. I mean, he was a fighter pilot, so he... He was, he was what you could, he was almost a triple ace, I think. So I think to be an ace, I believe, and I, I'm not an expert on this, but, you've, but you need to shut, shoot to have shot down five planes. And then Tom was almost a triple ace. So it was almost that was shot down 14, which, which you know, I've been up in, I've, had, I've had been lucky enough to be up in a Spitfire and a hurricane. And let me tell you, when you're up in the air, the idea of flying it is hard enough and being in it is hard enough. The idea of, of trying to shoot someone else down and not get shot down yourself would be extraordinary. It was so it's so hard. So Tom was this incredible pilot, and he told me these wonderful, brilliant stories, and 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 quite sometimes quite scary and harrowing stories as well. And I spent this lo- very magical summer with him in 2015. So I wanted to to pay a bit of homage to him. It is such a lovely bit in the book because every now and again he pops up with his kind of remarks and his thoughts about what's happening because, of course, from the human's point of view, like you say in the book, not all of the humans know that the birds and the animals are helping out. He must have been like, this is weird. Hardly any. There, hardly any. Uh, in the book, that there's a, there's a like, prime ministers, presidents, uh, heads of the army and the air force and the navy and some royalty are told um, and they're sworn to secrecy. And if they betray that trust, then a squadron of pigeons is on standby to basically make their life hell in the only way pigeons can. Yeah. By pooing on their heads every single day. So that's the threat that hangs over them for the rest of their life. So the secrets kind of is safe with them. So not many people know. So whilst all these extraordinary things are happening to Ginger in in the book, all he thinks is it's just luck or yeah. coincidence or fate or you know serendipity or something but actually in actual fact the birds are there doing a great job and 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 saving him from many scrapes i did love the pigeon bit because my uncle keeps pigeons he races them so um he has a little pigeon loft at the bottom of his garden so i i feel an affinity with anybody who mentions pigeons i used when i was a kid we used to have to take them on holiday with us we'd have a basket yeah. of pigeons to take on holiday uh, and I thought that's what everybody took on holiday with them until i was like surprisingly old i just thought that was a thing everyone did how old? Like, I want to say 11, which feels too old to not realise that you don't take pigeons on holiday. <laughs> Just a bit too old, you know? I'd love to have seen that conversation at school. So you, are you taking your pigeons to France with you? And your friend's like, 
What are you talking about? You know, toothbrush, toothpaste, pigeon. <laughs> like, th- that basket was in our cart all the time. That's so funny and so sweet. Yeah, I'm really glad that you um, that you put pigeons in there because, like I say, I do feel an affinity with them. And, and Linus is such a fun character because he's, like, he's, like you say, he's young, he's quick, he's enthusiastic. And I don't want to spoil it, but, like, he's, he's worthy of um, a lot of accolades, I would say. Yeah, he is. And he's a lovely character. And he's, a, you know, he's kind of, he's like Toto. He's, he's absolutely, his heart's in the right place. And he's central to your storyline. And when you've got your your lead, is, when you write a book, I'm sure a lot of your listeners write and have great ideas for stories. And where I tend to find the lead is kind of obviously the spine of the, of, of, of the book and the story. But it's quite often your peripheral characters are almost more fun to write, like your baddies yeah, or sure. your comedy characters, you know, because do they just give you... Like in the Toto books, I love writing for Archduke Ferdy Cat. Like he's, in many ways, he's one of my favourite characters. It's like Toto's sworn enemy. But as the books have evolved, Toto's realised that all he wants to do is run the world. He doesn't really, he's not particularly evil as such. He's just, he wants to, you know, he's quite stressed by the fact that humans run the world and he thinks he can do a better job. Just want some power. He just thinks that the animals would do a better job than humans are running the world. And to be honest, a lot of a lot of Toto's friends and Toto uh, included kind of agree with him. But it's just they can't they can't they can't abide that. But how he goes about it. So similarly in this in this book, you know, like I said, this is the first one. So the, so the characters haven't haven't evolved. I think the next book will be different characters, but a similar world, and there might be a little bit of crossover. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's amazing. So something to look out for where you've got like Easter eggs from the first book in the second one. Yes, exactly that, yeah. Now I did, I'm not going to lie to you, I've made up a silly game and I wondered whether you'd play it with me. Of course, the answer is yes. Thank you. It was uh, inspired by your book. It's called, I mean, bear with me on this. It's called Taylor Swift or A Swift Tale. I'm going to give you a fact and you have to tell me whether it's about Taylor Swift, a Swift or both. Are you okay with this? Hang on, what? This... I'm okay with it, right? It's the both I'm, fi- I'm, fixed. I'm now excited about. Okay. Okay, well, well okay, first up, um, this is pretty easy. We'll ease you in gently. What has tiny feet and almost no legs? Is it Taylor Swift or a Swift or both? Tiny feet and almost no legs. <laughs> well, I mean, with the greatest respect to Taylor, mm-hmm. I believe she does have feet and she definitely has legs. So let's go with... The bird is swift. Congratulations. You see, there you go. It's as easy as that. Yes. Yeah, well done. Um, this one might be a bit trickier. Um, known to spend several months of the year in Britain. <laughs> That's both. Yeah, it's both. <laughs> okay, you're getting it now. All right, lovely stuff. <laughs> Very good. Okay, often flies at 552 miles per hour. This is a bit trickier. I think that's Taylor Swift, because I don't think that Swift can fly that fast. It is indeed Taylor Swift, because she has her own Falcon 900 private jet. There you go. I'm doing, doing my research on Taylor Swift. Well, I knew, I knew Swifts can fly fast, but I was like, I don't think they can fly 500 miles an hour. <laughs> Probably going for it. Who spends a lot of time living around trees? Is it Swifts, Taylor Swift, or both? I'm going to say Taylor Swift, because Swifts, spend almost all of their time up in the air catching insects. They fly on the wing. So, I mean, I've taken a bit of artistic license in the book. Like, Okay, enough screen time. Oh, Dad, can you listen to the radio instead, please? I suppose so. They play some good tunes on... Not your boring grown-up station. It's not. Thank you, please. We can get that downstairs on the smart speaker, not in the bedroom. It's okay. We can get it on the app. If you say so. Okay. Thanks, Dad. Now, let me have your tablet. Screen time is over. About that, you just said we can listen on the app, and the app is on our tablet. It was downloaded from the App Store for free yesterday by Mum. But... You did promise. Listen anywhere. Smart kids listen on Smart Speaker. This is Fun Kids. Grab your BFFs and get stuck into Girl Talk magazine. Full of your fave celebs and YouTubers... Each issue is packed with fun, including puzzles and cute pets, quizzes and amazing bakes. All this plus awesome prizes, fab fashion and amazing gifts. Girl Talk magazine. Get it every month. What are you waiting for? They land. They don't really land. So I would say, unless the Swifts would be flying around to catch insects, I'm going to go Taylor Swift. 
You know what? I would have taken very many answers for that one, but I'm going to give you that one because Taylor Swift grew up on a Christmas tree farm. So yeah, she spent a lot of time around trees. <laughs> but you're right. Swifts have a lot on the wing. Uh, they they do. They often are known to be like nesting in trees. But yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give you that. So it's going pretty well for you, Dermot. This is the last one. What rarely touches the ground? Is it Swifts, Taylor Swift or both? And I will take physical and metaphorical interpretations of this. I mean, I'd say both for the simple reason that Taylor Swift is everywhere. And so therefore she's, you know, her feet never touch the ground. That's a kind of saying. And Swift definitely really ever touch the ground because like we just said, they spend so much of their time as high up. And sometimes they go into France, even when they're here, if they, dinner, if they can't catch their dinner and the conditions are wrong, they might even fly up to Northern France. But that's sometimes when you see them, the, when the, the pressure is like low pressure. So there's clouds, you see them come down, right down. But sometimes they can be so high up. So uh, when the weather's good. So let's go both. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, I, I love the answer. That was the one I wanted you to give was that technically both of them do. Also, I love the idea of flying to France for my dinner. How delightful that would be. Dermot, you passed my test I know. flying colours. Thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for playing my game and telling me all about your brand new book. Wings of Glory, by the way, is out the 15th of September. Is that right? Yeah, 14th, 14th I think. Mid-September, let's just call it mid-September. Give or take a day. People can pre-prepare for it, it's fine. <laughs> exactly. Brilliant, Dermot. Well, thank you so much for chatting to us. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Big thank you to Dermot O'Leary there. What a hero. Uh, next up, Kimberly Whittam is going to be telling me about Quiet Storm. Now, the main character, Storm, has always been very quiet, but when everything goes wrong at school, it might be time for her to speak up. All right. I am joined right now by author Kimberly Whittam. Hey, Kimberly, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. Not at all. Um, am I right in thinking that this new book, Quiet Storm, is this your debut book? It is. It's the very first book that came out a few months ago on the 8th of June. This is super, super exciting. And it's such a lovely, heartwarming book and one I could really relate to as well, uh, particularly because of the lead character. So can you tell us a little bit about Storm? Yeah, so Quiet Storm is about 12-year-old Storm who is incredibly shy and she doesn't really like to stand out from the crowd. She's just started secondary school. And between her older brother's popularity, giving her expectations that she feels like she can't meet, and her best friend meeting new friends, she feels left out and forgotten about. That is until one day she joins the athletics team and becomes the star of the show. And in Quiet Storm, we follow her on her journey as she's thrust into the spotlight to see whether she can run her race with all of her insecurities, or whether they'll stop her in her tracks. Oh, excellent. Yeah, it is such a beautiful book. And I, I remember when I went into year seven, uh, like Storm, I was separated from all of my friends from primary school. And um, it is absolutely devastating, isn't it? When you go to primary school and you think it's going to be at least some people there, you know, but there's nobody there. And then she has to start all over again. And it's such a transition from year six, where you're the, you're the big dogs, you're, yeah. you're the oldest in the school, to go right back to the bottom again. And when her best friend is in another form as well, um, and also then meets someone else that she's been kind of made to look after, uh, it, it does feel a bit isolating for Storm, doesn't it? It does, especially when she finds social situations really, really hard. And um, she used to have a best friend in primary school that would help her um, in lessons and stuff, but she just doesn't have that anymore. So things like reading aloud in class, um, answering questions, just little things that other people don't think are a big deal, she finds really, really challenging. So she does have a hard time. She does. It's this thing where um, one of her teachers asks her to read Lady Macbeth. I was like, yeah, that is that is painful if you're a bit shy. I mean, asked to read Shakespeare in class, right? I know. It's Yeah. Even now, um, I work in a secondary school and when I see teachers asking kids to read aloud, like, even I just feel anxious for them because it's just so <laughs> horrible, especially if you, if you shy like stuff. I couldn't do it. Like you say, you, you work in a secondary school. You've kind of written the story inspired by the shyer children that you maybe see. Yeah, definitely. But there's children that really want to try out the sports teams or the school play, but they're just really afraid to show up um, and join in. So I wanted to show children what it's like on the other side of their fear. So showing up is like the first hurdle. Once you do that, you'll see that things aren't as bad as you think that they will be. That's why I wanted to write the book. Oh, absolutely. So tell us uh, a little bit about the journey that Storm goes on when she realises how good she is at athletics. Yeah, so Storm breaks the record in her P lesson and she's asked to join the athletics team and she'll join it only if her best friend wants to, but after her best friend doesn't really have the same enthusiasm for sports as Storm does, she kind of just brushes it aside. She's not going by herself. There's just no way that she can. But then her big brother kind of helps her out a little bit 
whether Stone likes it or not. And then she's kind of thrust into the thrust into the limelight and we'll see whether they actually can go for it. It's a really cool idea because obviously you've got stuff about like losing friends and moving on or changing relationships, but also new friends as well and new people coming into your life, right? It is. And I always say to kids that struggle with making friends, like there's, there's someone for everyone out there and there's lots of ways that you can make friends, like joining a club like Storm is one way to make friends. So yeah, secondary school can be scary, but I feel like it's also a place where you can do lots of great, amazing things. And also Storm has so many big people and personalities in her life, her whole family and her brother, like you say, is a pretty big deal at school, right? Uh, yeah, he's head boy at school. So that's why I feel like Storm's kind of known as her big brother's little sister. And she feels like she can't really match that. And yeah, her mum's in a roller skating club. Her dad's in a rock band. She's got a very naughty dog. It's all happening around Storm. She lives in a very loud world. And it's just about how she navigates that as a quieter person. Yeah, it's such an, a lovely idea. And I really did feel for Storm. The idea that like you might be shy and you might be quiet, but it doesn't mean you're not strong and important and brave as well. Yeah, so I hope that Storm shows that you don't have to be allowed to have a voice and that you can join in. And Storm... The point of Storm's story isn't to show people how to be loud. It's about how to be yourself and to be comfortable in your own skin. Oh, that is beautifully put. It really is. Honestly, I really enjoyed this book. I love reading books about real life situations and dilemmas. And uh, this is one of my faves, actually, to read to read this book. Before I let you go, I do a little thing on Fun Kids, a little quick fire round of questions. A kind of this or that game, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, so first up, here we go. Uh, books or Kindles, which do you prefer? books definitely you just can't yeah. beat the smell of a good light like, and old book new book i just love the smell yeah that's what i always say is the smell um heroes or villains oh a good question <laughs> i'll say heroes but i do like a good villain i mean they are quite fun right but yeah heroes i'll take that yeah film adaptation or tv adaptation tv i feel like especially if it's a tv theory then you've got longer to tell the story uh beginnings or endings beginnings although i always write my endings for Oh, do you? That's interesting. Did you write the yeah. ending for this book first? Yeah. That's a weird way of doing it, but I love it. Um, writing or reading? Oh, reading? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you don't sound too convinced, but I'll take it. That's a hard <laughs> one. <laughs> Sports day or school play? Sport day, definitely. I was in my school play at school and it was just horrible. But yeah, <laughs> definitely sports day. <laughs> I was 100% the other way around. Yeah. Um, laptop or write by hand? Write by hand. I always have to write by hand. It's actually so frustrating to have to do it twice. But yeah, definitely write my hand first. Wow, that's a rarity. Um, do you write nine to five or just whenever you fancy? Whenever I fancy. Uh, Paddington Bear or Winnie the Pooh? Paddington Bear, hands down. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the big one, salt and vinegar or cheese and onion? Salt and vinegar. Oh, yeah, I went straight for salt and vinegar, but now you said it, cheese and onion. Oh, no. Oh, really? Oh, onion. <laughs> wow, I've never had somebody change their mind halfway through that question before. <laughs> that's a hard question. Well, that's my ultimate. I'm not going to lie to you, Kimberly. Uh, salt and vinegar is my favourite. So I just wanted to see if we're on the same page. <laughs> but we're not. And that's fine. We were like halfway on the same page. I'll let you off with that one. So Quiet Storm, we should say, is out right now. So everybody can grab it wherever it is they get their books from, right? Yeah, it's out now everywhere. And it's the perfect time to buy it back to school and time. Yeah. It is definitely the good vibes for going back to school. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for telling us all about Quiet Storm. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you so much to Kimberly. Uh, now, Kimberly will be chatting all things Quiet Storm at the Reading is Magic Festival on the 6th of October. It runs from the 2nd to the 6th, and the festival is returning for its fourth year with loads of amazing authors and engaging talks that you can go and attend, some of them from the comfort of your very own home. If you want to find out a little bit more, just go to readingismagicfestival.com. Now, before we go, let's check in with a little voice note from Claire Fayers. She's the winner of the Children's Indie Book of September, and she's going to give us a little intro and a reading to Tapper Watson and the quest for the Nemo machine. Hi, I'm Claire Fayers, and I'm excited to introduce my latest book, Tapper Watson and the quest for the Nemo machine. The story is a mashup of Greek myth and science fiction, set in a world just like our own, with one or two differences. There is a portal in Swansea Bay leading to a giant space river that will take you to a thousand other worlds. There are acrobatic octopus scientists, a plant that talks in Morse code, intrepid intergalactic smugglers, a secret criminal cabal, trigger-happy lobster mobsters, and an ordinary alien boy called Tapper Watson, who was quite happy staying at home reading his favourite adventure stories until his uncle sent him off for work experience on a space submarine. Halfway through the trip, 
the submarine is damaged and put in at Earth for repairs. And Tapper meets Fern Shakespeare. When Fern's father loses his memory, the only thing that can help him is one of his own inventions, the Nemo machine. But the machine has been stolen, and so Tapper and Fern launch into a quest across worlds to find it. Whenever they start writing a book, I always start by making a list of the things that I really like. And my list with Tapper Watson included Star Wars and Star Trek, different worlds, submarines, strange aliens, parts of jokes, Greek myths, especially the myth of Jason and the quest for the Golden Fleece. I thought, wouldn't it be fun to turn that story into a space adventure? And that's where the idea started. But as well as mixing myth with sci-fi, I wanted to see what would happen if I mixed two people from very different worlds with very different personalities. Tapper's the youngest of a huge family, and he suffers horribly from anxiety, which makes him afraid to do anything in case he makes a mistake. Fern's family is basically just her and her dad, and she's jealous of Tapper with all its brothers and sisters and cousins. She, but she's very confident, and she races into situations without thinking. But Tapper really, really hates. Their worlds have different customs, which cause a lot of confusion. And they don't much like each other at first. But through their adventures, they become friends. And Tapper learns that real heroes are not the people from his books who stride about with golden laser blasters shooting their way out of danger. Heroes are ordinary people who don't give up when things get difficult. I'm going to read you the opening of the book where I introduce the river between worlds. The river between worlds swarmed with a million colours and strange shapes. A three-headed crocodile appeared and snapped his jaws before dispersing back into darkness. Next, a tree appeared, sprouting silver branches with rainbows instead of leaves. The rainbows shriveled and fell, each one spinning away, until the tree itself disintegrated into a shower of coloured lights which scattered into constellations and vanished. The river had different names on different worlds, the Lethe, the Last, the Lythe. It twisted through the universe, joining all 1,001 worlds together, and its waters contained the memories of everyone who had ever lived. Every idea, every dream, every passing thought. They whirled and eddied as the waters carried them, forever colliding and forming new shapes. Echoes. Created from the echoes of memories. Mostly, they flitted in and out of existence like ghosts. But sometimes, when a passing submarine waked up the waters, they could become solid, not for long, but long enough to cause some serious damage. That was what Tapper was worried about. He watched from his seat at one side of the control room with a bald goes. Submarines rarely sprang leaks, and if they did, you could probably fix them without accidentally swallowing any river water. Probably. Lethic water absorbed memories. Drink just one drop and you would forget everything. There were many things Tapper would like to forget. All the times his cousins laughed at him for the start. But that was what you had to put up with when you were only 13 years old and the youngest of 68 cousins. Papa looked out at the Lethe and suppressed a shudder, wishing he was safely back at home on Eris. Eris was a nice world, calm and orderly. Everyone knew their place and families looked after each other. His cousins laughed at him, but they meant well. He still couldn't believe he was here in an interworld submarine with two alien merchants. Well, what an episode it's been. A big thank you to Claire, to Kimberly Whittam and to Dermot O'Leary for telling us all about their brilliant big new books. And of course, thank you so much to you for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, remember to like, subscribe and follow us wherever it is you get your pods from. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Hey. 
Hey, kids, time to get to school. Can we have fun kids in the car? I think it'll have to be my station this morning, kids. I'm not sure we can get fun kids in the car. Yes, we can. We've got Apple CarPlay. Um, yes, but I'm not sure how we do it. I know. The Fun Kids app works with CarPlay or Android Auto, like Nikki's mum's car has. So, Dad, all you need to do is plug your phone into the car and you'll see the app appear on the dashboard. True, but, um, I was going to drive mum's car today as mine has to go to be fixed. That's OK. You can connect your phone through Bluetooth in Mum's car. Where do you get all these facts? You should listen to Fun Kids more. Take Fun Kids with you. Download the app and when you're in the car, you can Bluetooth it. Or connect it to Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Grab your BFFs and get stuck into Girl Talk magazine. Full of your fave celebs and YouTubers. Each issue is packed with fun, including puzzles and cute pets, quizzes and amazing bakes. All this plus awesome prizes, fab fashion and amazing gifts. Girl Talk magazine. Get it every month. What are you waiting for?